It's easy to think of the internet as something that's just all around us to which we have nearly unfettered access. Just think about how often you've accessed the internet today. You're doing it right now to watch this video. Every email you sent, every scroll through a social media website, a visit to Wikipedia, a video game played, a movie or song streamed relies on you having a stable connection to the web. So what would happen if all that access was cut off? For you, losing the internet would be a personal catastrophe that stops you from working, strips you of your entertainment options, and stops you from sharing funny cat videos on Facebook. But for an entire country, the removal of control over the internet could be a nationwide catastrophe that leads to that country becoming a less powerful player on the geopolitical level. Enter the United States. It's identified the internet as one of the many weapons it's capable of wielding against expanding Chinese commercial and militaristic interests, and it's going to use that weapon to wage a silent war against Beijing to remove it from the internet for good. How? It all comes down to undersea cables. In the age of Wi-Fi, it can seem like the internet has achieved near omnipresence. Like oxygen, it's in the air all around us, just waiting for us to tap an icon on a phone to deliver a connection that links us to the entire world. But in reality, the internet is powered by physical cables running so deep under the sea that they're inaccessible to all but those who manufacture and lay those cables. These physical cables, Time Magazine says there are over 400 of them running along the world's seabeds, creating a network of cables with a length of almost 750,000 miles if they were laid end to end. For context, that's only 115,000 miles less than the diameter of the Sun, the largest singular body in our solar system. Collectively, this expansive network handles more than 95% of global internet traffic, with one law professor at Cambridge University, Surabi Ranganathan, referring to them as the out-of-sight arteries of globalization. That's an extremely apt description. Without these cables, the internet as we know it simply wouldn't be possible. It certainly wouldn't be the all-encompassing global entity we know it as today, an entity capable of supporting global communications and trade on a level that allows true cooperation between countries. The entire concept of laying such cables so deep below the surface of the sea may seem like a modern marvel of technology, but the truth is that concept has existed for nearly two centuries. In 1858, the first transatlantic cable was laid, connecting Ireland to Newfoundland in Canada and enabling telegraph communications between the two nations. Though that early cable was subject to faults, it started to degrade quickly and eventually fried when the voltage was turned up. A new type of cable began to be laid in 1865, setting the stage for the network that we have today. In 2023, each new cable laid can handle a staggering 200 terabits of data every second, with that data rocketing along fiber optic cables that are barely above the width of a single human hair. Each subsea cable contains anywhere between 4 and 12 of these fiber optic strands, and depending on the depth of the cable and the level of protection it needs, it may be no more than the width of your thumb. Even in areas where the cables need to be stronger, they rarely become wider than the width of an average wrist. It's remarkable to think that something so seemingly fragile could be responsible for the world having access to the internet. Assuming a cable is properly manufactured and laid, it can sit in C2 for around 25 years. A gel coating around the fiber optics inside the cable keeps them safe, as does an inner copper tubing, which also carries electricity through the cable. Plastic aluminum, and in many cases steel, is wrapped around that cable to lend it even more protection against the harsh salt water that will wash over it day after day. Add to all of this the repeaters, which are placed 25 to 50 miles apart along the cables that amplify the signal as it travels and you have a wondrous example of human ingenuity and endeavor. And like so many examples of human brilliance, these cables are now being weaponized. But how is that possible? To explain, allow us to provide an example. In February 2023, the United States-based company called Subcom landed a new deal to install a subsea cable project that would serve as an additional link between Asia and Europe. Running from Singapore to France, the project will cost $600 million to deliver, with the deal on the surface seeming to be a completely innocent example of a talented team of installers winning a major contract. Scratch below the surface and you start to see how America is using deals like these to wage a silent war against China. Three years before Subcom won the contract to lay this cable, with its $600 million bid, HMN Technologies Company, or HMN Tech, was on the verge of getting it. It even got as far as being selected for the job, with a $500 million bid, about a third less than the bid entered by Subcom at the time, and even now $100 million less than the bid with which Subcom eventually won the contract. 
So why didn't HMN Tech manage to keep the contract it had won? In short, because it's a Chinese company. According to Reuters, HMN Tech was able to table such a low bid because it was being subsidized by Beijing. If it had won, the project would not only have been HMN Tech's largest to date, but it would have cemented the company as one of the world's fastest growing subsea cable layers. In addition to its own growth, securing that project would have also led to great things for several Chinese telecom firms, all of which had an interest in investing in HMN Tech so they could use the new cable to expand their reach. The client for that cable was a consortium of global firms, each with an interest in getting the cable installed. China Telecom, China United Network Communications Group, and China Mobile Limited were all part of that consortium. But so too were Microsoft and Orange, a French telecom firm, along with several other smaller organizations. It seemed that the deal was done and that HMN Tech would be the one to focus on getting the cable laid in 2020 and beyond. But the deal never went through. Concerned about the possibility of China using the new cable to spy on the data transmitted through it, the US government started a campaign to have that contract flipped over to Subcom. Through a combination of lobbying and offering incentives, some may uncharitably see that as bribery, to the consortium members making the decision on who would lay the cable, the United States was successful. According to Time, the US made a concerted effort to get telecom firms on its side during the bidding process, with the media outlet even suggesting that threats of sanctions were made. Reuters digs deeper. It reports that the US Trade and Development Agency, or USTDA, offered what it calls training grants to five of the telecom companies involved in the consortium. Those grants totaled $3.8 million and came with strings attached. You get the money if you choose Subcom for the cable contract. All five of the companies, Bharati Airtel, Telecom Egypt, Djibouti Telecom, Devehi Rajajaj Gulen, and Sri Lanka Telecom accepted that offer. On the sanctions side of things, Washington also warned several members of the consortium of its intent to impose devastating sanctions on HMN Tech. And wouldn't you know it, those sanctions would be so severe that they would place each consortium member's investments into the project at risk. Much better to go with Subcom to make sure all those millions of dollars don't go to waste. This wasn't an empty threat either. In 2021, Reuters reported that Washington had added HMN Tech to a list of companies on which it would impose sanctions, arguing the Chinese firm operated with the intention of acquiring American technology to help them with modernization efforts of China's army. Combined, these sweeteners and sanctions were a fairly brazen plot by the US, but it's a plot that worked, and Subcom won the contract. HMN Tech was left out to dry, and the United States had won yet another victory in the undersea cable race. We say yet another because this is far from the first time the US has used its political powers to guarantee that a Chinese-owned company fails to win a contract for the installation of one of these cables. The Department of Justice even has a dedicated team the Committee for the Assessment of Foreign Participation in the United States Telecommunications Services Sector to handle the job. Colloquially known as Team Telecom, this group seems to exist for the sole purpose of interfering with Chinese companies to prevent them from winning bids to lay the arteries through which the blood of the internet flows. The results of the team's work? Well, according to writers, America has managed to disrupt at least six cable deals, all involving HMN Tech, to prevent the Chinese company from winning the deals. That disruption has tended to focus on cables that would have connected the United States to Chinese-owned territories, with all leading to either rerouting or abandonment of the projects. The question now is simple, why? The United States clearly stands to gain from its silent war on China's ability to lay undersea internet cables. But why is it going so far as to openly threaten sanctions on the Chinese companies that could build those cables? There are several reasons. The first is espionage. The United States has good reason to suspect China of wanting to tap into the data being transmitted by these massive cables, because it has a history of doing the exact same thing itself. In the 1970s, the United States launched Operation Ivy Bells, sending the USS Halibut submarine deep into the Sea of Okhotsk, which lay in Soviet territory. The operation involved sending a small team of divers 400 feet down to the ocean floor. Each diver had a simple mission find a cable measuring just 5 inches in diameter that was being used to transmit messages between Soviet military bases. The mission wasn't that complex. The USS Halibut was actually on the search for signs warning Soviet boats not to lay anchor for the risk of damaging the cables, which gave its crew an approximate location. From there, they dived. Eventually, the team found the cable and installed a listening device, measuring 20 feet in length, along that cable without piercing its casing. 
From then on, the U.S. sent Navy divers to the device to retrieve its recordings and fit new tapes, with each recording containing valuable intelligence for use in the Cold War. Today, it takes a little more than that to tap an undersea internet cable. Many of these cables are now installed alongside underwater sensors, which can detect if a submarine or a diver happens to draw near. But that doesn't prevent countries from trying. In 2015, the United States claimed that its sensors had detected several Russian submarines traveling a little too close for comfort to some of its communications cables. With those same sensors also detecting spy ships that may have contained special underwater vehicles designed to damage cables. There are also reports, though not confirmed by the United States military, that the USS Jimmy Carter sub has some sort of advanced cable tapping technology. And of course, it hasn't escaped America's notice that China has spent several years developing a stronger fleet of submarines, possibly with the intention of sabotaging or tapping its undersea cables. In truth, tapping or damaging an undersea cable is a difficult, though not impossible, endeavor today thanks to a combination of underwater sensors and encryption technology, but neither would be a concern for China if it happened to own the cable or could influence the company behind the cable to the point where it could receive sensitive data from it. That's what the United States worries about. By allowing HMN Tech to install cables to lead to either it or the countries that it calls allies, the US could expose its secrets through those Chinese-installed cables. Hence, there are concerted campaigns and sanctions against HMN Tech. However, the possibility of spying or even sabotage isn't the only reason why the US is so keen to keep control of the cables. America attempting to control cable installation isn't just a defensive move against Chinese spying, it's an offensive one that delivers the ability to track Chinese communications. Think about the project that Subcom 1 from HMN Tech as an example. That line is now being built by an American-owned company, and it connects Singapore to one of America's major allies. It's not outside of the realm of possibility that the US would track the data being sent via that cable, making it practically useless to the Chinese military. Expand this approach globally, and you get a network of American-made cables, all of which could conceivably be used to check in on what China is doing at any moment. That may seem inconceivable. After all, the United States has laws about this sort of thing. The right to privacy is enshrined in the nation's constitution, so it surely wouldn't go so far as to spy on the data being sent via these massive internet cables. Doing so would mean sifting through the data being transmitted by millions of American citizens too. That's true, but it's not like the US doesn't offer some precedent in this regard either. The National Security Agency, or NSA, scandal of the 2010s involved the United States building a vast database of American telephone records. It actively spied on its own citizens, ostensibly to route the terror out, but in doing so, completely subverted the right to privacy that every American is supposed to have. So who's to say it wouldn't do the same thing again on an even greater scale? After all, the three largest subsea cable installers are Subcom, owned by an American company, along with France's Alcatel Submarine Networks and Japan's NEC Corporation. France and Japan are American allies with the latter also having deep-rooted security concerns related to China. Maybe ensuring that this trio continues to dominate provides the United States with the option of tapping into web communications should it need to in order to thwart Chinese ambitions. This is all speculative. Though it is clear America's reasons for keeping China out of the subsea cable game have as much to do with strengthening itself as they do about keeping information out of China's hands. Add to all this the commercial benefits that come with disrupting Chinese companies. We see these benefits come into play with another example of the US getting involved in a project that had links to China, a set of four cables intended to link Hong Kong to the United States. Since 2020, the American telecoms team has managed to ensure the cancellation of all four of those cable projects, supposedly because linking Hong Kong gives China access to American data. And that's not necessarily wrong. In 2019, Beijing launched a security crackdown on Hong Kong, which is supposed to be a special administrative region that operates under its own rule. That crackdown led to higher levels of surveillance, with Washington naturally starting to worry that this surveillance would extend to the cables that were supposed to link Hong Kong to the US. Devin DeBacker, a senior member of Team Telecom, said as much when he said the cancellation stemmed from the way that China has eroded Hong Kong's autonomy essentially giving it an all-access path to American data should the project be completed. By canceling the project, Team Telecom left several of its backers, including Meta, Amazon, and Google, furious. Google and Meta even teamed up to argue to the Federal Communications Commission, or the FCC, 
that the argument that China might intercept data transmitted via the cables was unsupportive and speculative. Their argument did not work. Now the cables that were supposed to connect Hong Kong to America lay dormant at the bottom of the sea and several projects in which tech titans like Google and Meta invested have been limited. For instance, the Pacific Light Cable Network, which was originally supposed to include a Hong Kong cable, will now only transmit data from the United States to Taiwan and the Philippines. What does all this have to do with commercialism? After all, it seems like the US is damaging its own companies, Google, Meta, and Amazon, all are American businesses, by forcing the abandonment of the project. But the states isn't cutting off its nose despite its face here. Instead, it's achieving two goals. First, by preventing the cable linking Hong Kong to the US, it's going some way to isolating an increasingly Chinese-controlled territory from business opportunities. In short, Hong Kong won't be able to access the super-fast internet speeds that these new cables would generate. This idea is called technological decoupling, with the intent being to essentially isolate China and its territories from the rest of the world at least with respect to the undersea network of internet cables. Given that Hong Kong has such a powerful financial infrastructure, the cancellation of this project severs what could have been a crucial business link. Second, US interference in this and other deep-sea cable projects is clearly having an impact on HMN Tech. Reuters says that the company had supplied 18% of cables that are intended to come online in the four years between 2018 and 2022. Now it's set to be responsible for just 7% of the cables that are currently in development around the globe, meaning the company has likely missed out on hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. It lost 600 million to Subcom alone. It'll lose much more, meaning less money being pumped into China. That can only mean good things for the US as China continues to use its financial muscle to build its military and strengthen its grip on global commercial operations. So what we're seeing here is war. It's just not war as we know it. Rather, it's a strange type of proxy war over technology that could play a huge role in determining whether the US or China achieves military and commercial dominance in the coming years. And make no mistake about it, this is a war that the US is taking very seriously. In addition to all the tactics we've discussed so far in this video, the US Congress passed the Undersea Cable Control Act of 2023. The language used to refer to that bill is telling. In the press release relating to the bill published on U.S. Representative Brian Mast's website, it's referred to as bipartisan legislation to protect American superiority in undersea cable capabilities from China's economic and military reach. Mast even says that he believes that the U.S. has been caught flat-footed in countering Chinese influence, citing spy balloons and TikTok as an example of how America needs to up its game. It's certainly doing that with the telecoms team and official legislation recognizing its efforts to dominate the undersea cable industry, the US is taking a previously silent war public. It's announcing to the world, especially China, that it intends to control access to the internet because that control will prove vital in the future geopolitics of the world that relies increasingly on technology. Of course, China isn't taking all of this lying down. Rather than focusing on the cables it can't control, i.e. any that have a connection to the United States, it's instead turning its attention toward home territory. For instance, an April 2023 Reuters report says that several state-owned telecom firms are working together on a $500 million project that'll see cables being laid to connect several countries in Asia, Europe, and the Middle East. The network would be one of the most advanced in the world, and crucially, it appears that no non-Chinese companies are involved. That cable would link Chinese Hainan province to Hong Kong before splitting into several sub-cables that stretch to Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Singapore, France, and Egypt. HMN Tech will be responsible for the construction. It's one of several that represent China's emerging approach to undersea cable wars. If the US doesn't cooperate, we'll just focus on territory that it can't influence. Interestingly, China may even be able to roll these projects into its Belt and Road Initiative, or BRI, which is an extensive infrastructure program through which it lends developing nations money to build new facilities. Perhaps Chinese cables will become a new arm of that program, giving China the opportunity to build ties to countries through superior internet that could serve it well in the future conflicts with the US. The Great Firewall of China is another strategy that Beijing has been using for several years to overcome US interference. Focused primarily on censorship, the strategy is all about preventing Chinese citizens from accessing websites that would provide them with information Beijing doesn't want them to see. A BBC report from 2019 provides an example from Hyun Jin Seo, an associate professor in journalism from the University of Kansas. During a July 2018 visit to Beijing, 
Professor Sale brought up the bombing of an American embassy in Beijing. None of her Chinese friends knew about it, and that's because the news hadn't been allowed to reach their feeds. The firewall is one symptom of China's plan to essentially operate its own version of the internet, one that's for Chinese eyes only and can be used as a propaganda tool rather than a platform through which people can find information from all over the world. Combine that censorship approach with China choosing to build subsea cables with which the US can't interfere, and you get a form of digital isolation that China may impose on other nations as a condition of receiving their technology. Then there's Taiwan. For any who believe that China wouldn't commit or isn't capable of committing the subterfuge that the United States fears, you only need to listen to what's suspected to have been done in Taiwan in early 2023. During March that year, many of the residents of Matsu, a small Taiwanese island that sits close to China, were left without internet. Something had happened to the pair of submarine-installed internet cables that ensure the island's 14,000 residents can connect to the web. Taiwan's National Communications Commission NCC, had only one suspect, China. The NCC claimed that a pair of Chinese ships were responsible for cutting the cables that supply Matsu. The first was a small fishing vessel, which is suspected to have sailed 31 miles out to sea before doing something to damage one of the cables. On February 8, the Chinese cargo ship apparently finished the job by severing the second cable. Granted, Taiwan didn't go so far as to make a direct accusation against China, giving itself enough leeway in its statements to allow people to assume the cutting may have been an accident. But in reality, Taiwan is preparing for Beijing to cut off access to its internet as one of the opening salvos in an invasion. In today's world, you could easily argue that having access to the internet is as vital as having access to electricity, heating, even clean water. It's for that very reason that any war between the United States and China will be fought as much below the sea as above, with both nations' navies attacking the web's deep-sea circulatory system to gain an edge. The US is preparing for that eventuality by trying to gain as much ownership over these cables as possible. China is fighting back by building its own networks, outside America's grasp, while showing that it is capable of waging this secret war. Perhaps the ultimate victor will be the country that shows itself most capable of winning a fight that the vast majority don't even realize is happening. The final question is one that we pose to you. Who do you think will win the secret war that's happening deep under the ocean waves? Let us know your thoughts below, and thank you for watching the video. Now go ahead and check out this video, or maybe this one instead.